Okay, then welcome back and thanks for attending also the last day of this little workshop on Bayesian inference. Um, today, of course, with the highlight of the whole thing, namely variational inference. And um, yeah, before we start talking about variational inference, I wanted to highlight that this is a topic, <laughs> that this exists. It's not only something that uh, I put on slides to annoy everyone. Um, so one of the incarnations that you see variational inference, or as it was called like 10 years ago, variational base, um, uh, today variational autoencoders. It's actually not that, uh, at least to me, when I look at um, presentations of variational autoencoders or articles like this, it's it's a little bit weird. It's not that easy to figure out because they don't somehow they don't want to use a proper um, probabilistic model um, description of what they are doing, but uh, they are doing something and it involves uh, a variational inference. And at one point, it also involves a, a neural network model. Um, yeah, so it exists. It's a topic. Um, so if you talk to Belinda about the machine learning summer schools that she attended, uh, you will hear that variational inference or variational autoencoding. Uh, yeah, there were sessions on that. And uh, some of the sessions, at least in my land, uh, were actually that great that no, she left again, um, were that great that um, the people who gave these presentations don't share their slides. So some of these variational autoencoding slides from the machine learning summer school in Myland are not available. Um, but you will find, yeah, you find if you go into the machine learning community things or go to DeepMind, uh, to the website of DeepMind or, or yeah, everything that is calling itself AI these days, you will come across variational autoencoding. You also find a lot of uh, things, blogs about that. It, for me, it doesn't quite get clear. So it, it's not that easy to relate it because somehow I feel they, so so some people, they know what they're doing and then they have good papers. For example, this Tim Sullivan's uh, guy, so he has uh, good stuff, but sometimes it's also like, oh, variation, uh, don't know. Anyway, it exists and um, it's something that, um, yeah, is of interest to the current, um, um, current, sorry, can you turn off your mics? Um, is um, of interest to people who work on data analysis these days. So that's variational autoencoding and that's variational inference. Essentially, at one point, there's a neural network somewhere in there or two, and, but it's, it's probabilistic modeling is, uh, or generative modeling, also these diffusion models that exist now. It's, they're usually quite uh, badly described but <laughs> apparently they use variational inference. Um, another uh, reason to talk about variational inference um, from, so that was kind of the tech world uh, where variational inference these days plays a role. So the internet tech AI world, uh, another, um, yeah, environment where variational inference plays a big role, um, as I already mentioned, it's uh, cognitive neuroscience um, or um, let's say theoretical cognitive neuroscience because the experimental evidence for all of this is still fairly thin, but a lot of people um, now uh, after like 15 to 20 years of the free energy principle like to talk about it and uh, join the bandwagon and uh, preach the free energy principle and uh, how much it explains and so on. That's all very nice, but it would also be good if the if there would be more experimental work actually on that. Um, 
yeah, but it exists. And I think, as I already mentioned uh, yesterday, I think in some in between lectures uh, conversations, I think the active inference and or active inference is kind of the action oriented aspect of uh, the free energy principle. Um, that is essentially the only idea that came out, came out of cognitive neuroscience in the last 25 years or something so it's it's something it's it's how uh, uh, people who are into understanding what the brain does uh, uh, um, uh, think about what the brain does or at least have a reference point to say that's not what the brain does but uh, it's not that easy to come up with, or it's it's um, not that easy, but uh, or, uh, let's say another way, uh, nobody really came up with a better idea um, than the free energy principle um, for what the brain does. And the, the bottom line of the free energy principle or active inference, which is this two names for the same thing, um, is that uh, the, the basic idea is the brain does variational inference for in perception, in action, everywhere. The brain does variation in France. That's the idea. And um, so to understand then what the idea is, of course, it makes sense to understand variation in France. Finally, so tech world, cognitive new science world, but then there's also a little bit more the down to earth world, namely data science, um, data analysis. Um, so there has been this paper by David Bly on variation inference, uh, a review for statisticians. Um, so, yeah, basically, hopefully variational inference is making its way also a little bit back into the more down-to-earth data analytical, statistical, whatever um, communities because it's... Um, yeah, it was kind of developed and and um, and pushed and so on more on the outskirts of of the down to earth uh, data ana analysis statistics math world because it has uh, yeah, always happened a little bit more in machine learning than in, in mathematical statistics, but um, it would be good if it um, yeah, enters uh, the standard canon a little bit more because um, although it's, it's a very general idea and a very useful idea and a very um, all-encompassing, the actually actual properties um, and the um, yeah the understanding of the algorithms that derive from it uh, are um, not that uh, far developed so um, there is uh, from my perspective um, quite some work to do on um, actually studying the qualitative properties of variational inference. So it's, it's, it's a big idea of how you can do um, inference and probabilistic models. And it gives you kind of a recipe to do uh, inference in uh, probabilistic models in an approximate sense. And it does so, as we will see from a much more um, uh, yeah, stringent and clear theoretical framework than, for example, um, the stuff that we saw yesterday on numerical inference. But although this is all very nice, the actual um, properties and qualitative properties, so the question of whether this is actually doing something something sensible uh, is then often not that clear. And um, that's definitely, um, yeah, there's a lot of, room for research on studying the qualitative properties of um, the results of variational inference. So that's always something that I want and have not really, but want to contribute, but it's, um, yeah, it's all a question of time. Um, so this is a very nice uh, review, although it's also not, um, so that the application that they um, have in there is not the novel, I think it's a mixture model. So that's, you find that in the machine learning textbooks from the early 2000s as well. But um, it's, um, it's a down to earth and really talking about the content because the problem with these two things is always they are then interested that you have 
images that look a certain way or you have this art thing and it's more uh, everything is centered somehow on the awesome results that you get from using it and it's not so much of explaining what it's really about um, this is uh, always more like yeah it's also not about explaining too much the math but uh, to have kind of a big idea and be inspiring and so on it's all nice but if you really want to understand what's going on uh, i think looking into the actual um, um, literature and hopefully more and more the down-to-earth statistical probabilistic modeling liter uh, literature this is in a way where we also uh, then will look at it here so the plan is um, to first discuss the foundations um, to some depth and of course link it to bayesian inference um, as we discuss all the uh, time in this workshop and then um, look at one specific instance um, of an application of variational inference, um, namely to the general linear model. The thing is variational inference uh, is a big idea and it's kind of a unification, a little bit like the GLM, a unification of many things that have accumulated in the data analytical world and the probabilistic modeling world over the last 250 years or something like that um, and um, then if you have this big idea that's nice but if uh, of course then the examples are also again important and then different ways to apply um, variational inference in fact um, yeah you can one can show that basically everything that um, from so, so that variation inference is a general framework and um, things like maximum likelihood estimation restricted maximum likelihood estimation or expectation maximization they are all special cases of um, variational inference and this is something that we followed uh, up a little bit in this paper on the glm um, and variational inference in 2017 yeah, so that's the plan. So uh, first the foundations and the general idea, and then uh, one um, specific example um, in a data analytical context. Okay, um, Ben, before we start, any questions? Okay, so I hope I gave you the impression that this is something and uh, if you google it you will find if you google variation of base variation of inference and so on then you will find uh, different uh, um, things and they all refer essentially to the same thing um yeah maybe one last thing before we start because i think it will also not be that evident from what we're going to do uh, this name variational in variational inference um, that derives from variational calculus which is um, a generalization of um, calculus you know in calculus the aim is always to, or one of the aims of calculus is to um, find uh, extremal points of uh, functions so you have functions that take in numbers and you try to figure out uh, um, at what point uh, does a given function have a um, minimum or a maximum um, and that's what calculus is about so you compute derivatives and uh, set them to zero and so on and um, one can generalize this idea of calculus uh, to something that is called variational calculus um, and that refers to um, studying functionals um, and functional the term functional is a little bit of an old uh, term um, but um, because in modern words one would just say function but the characterizing feature of a functional is that um, it's a function of a function so functionals uh, instead of taking numbers in they take functions in so they are functions of functions and um, if you try to figure out now the minimum of a um, functional um, 
with respect to its input argument, and then it's of course with respect to a function. So you try to minimize, um, so the, the extreme points that you derive are functions. So you minimize some quantity and um, this quantity is a function of a function and then the minimum point is a function. And this is called, um, doing this, this is called variational calculus that doesn't have anything to do with Bayesian inference um, that has been around for a long time time. Um, and um, in variational inference, one also, in principle, one, there's a specific functional, namely the free energy or the elbow, um, that one tries to um, maximize, minimize, depending on its sign, um, with respect to probability density functions. We will see this, um, but we will not really discuss variational calculus. I just want to highlight here at the beginning that the term variational has nothing to do with variance or something like that, uh, like in the statistics world, but it uh, refers to variational calculus. However, then one doesn't really need variational calculus anymore, uh, one can say, um, to do variational inference. So that's then a little bit how things evolve. Um, one can invoke variational calculus in variational inference. We did that in our 2014 paper, um, but one can also not invoke variational calculus and um, then it's a little bit strange that this whole thing is called variational inference but there's never th something variational happening. Good, so that's, uh, I think, enough said before we actually now start. So um, I cast the whole thing here um, in terms of um, a problem that one wants to solve, uh, which I here call the variational inference problem. Essentially, this is exactly the same thing as um, the Bayesian inference problem that we have already seen with the only difference that um, I denote theta, which were our parameters uh, by Z now. Um, if you think in terms of statistical models, um, like the ones um, that we mentioned a couple of times, like one sample t-test or um, the GLM or things like that, then this Z um, is just exactly like the theta, the parameters that we've seen before. Why I use Z here is because one can generalize that to um, other forms of unobservable random variables that might not be that clearly associated with a parameter intuition, but more with a latent variable intuition, for example, in um, linear Gaussian state space models or any kind of state space models in filtering and so on. That it's not really important for us here. Um, I just, um, variational inference can do more than just Bayesian inference in um, these models that we've seen. So that's why I um, went to Z here uh, instead of theta, but you can, uh, read the whole thing as theta, and then we are essentially there where we uh, were before. Um, we have um, some uh, observable random entity, epsilon, and we have um, uh, not directly or uh, unobservable random entity, z. And we have a probabilistic model. We uh, define the whole thing in terms of the PDF or PMF. And we have a joint distribution over the observable and the unobservable. and um, we um, write this down in terms of a um, conditional distribution of the observable given the unobservable uh, entity times the marginal of the uh, unobservable. So that's exactly the same thing um, if you replace uh, z by theta, as we always seen in this um, course. And um, the aims are also actually the same um, things as in uh, Bayesian inference. This is why one, of course, can use this whole thing for Bayesian inference. Um, one aim is to approximate or evaluate um, the um, conditional distribution of Z given Y. Uh, 
theta given y, so the unobservable giving the observ observable, and the other aim is to um, evaluate um, the log model evidence, which is just the log, so natural logarithm of um, the evidence, which is again um, just uh, another name for the marginal probability density of um, observed data, um, which um, derives from the joint distribution by integrating out um, the latent um, entity. Again, all of all of these things can be fairly high dimensional, so that's why I'm always talking about entities and not random variables. But um, in the in the simplest or in the least complex case, y is a random variable and that is a random variable and that's it. Um, but of course, um, usually in applications, y are then vectors and z are also vectors or other things. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, in general, or often, if, if one talks about variation and inference, the um, the P's here are actually um, PDFs rather than PMFs. There is not much, or I haven't seen much on variation and inference in uh, more measure theoretic uh, probabilistic terms so in more uh, when talking about distributions instead of um, pdfs or pmfs if you look into machine learning it's often quite unclear what they mean but usually implicitly they mean pdfs um, we wrote in the supplement of the 2017 paper we um, yeah developed a measure theoretic or probability theoretic model of um, variational inference, but I haven't seen much of that somewhere else. Um, yeah. So again, it is exactly like Bayesian inference. There's a, a um, joint distribution. Um, there's a likelihood, there's a prior. One wants to find the other um, conditional distribution, so the posterior. And one wants to find the um, uh, marginal density or mass of some observed data for model comparison. That's about it. Questions about this? Because this is, in a way, what we did also the last couple of days. Apparently not. And now we then go to um, yeah, a fundamental theorem um, for variation and inference. Um, we um, assume that we have defined um, this probabilistic model. And um, now we just invent um, another PDF or PMF over the latent random variables, so um, QZ. And we call this a variational distribution. Um, this is um, then, um, yeah, it's just, I mean, we defined those things and this we just now say, let's, uh, let's assume that we have another um, distribution here. We call this variational distribution. Then the following holds, and this is uh, crucial, the log model evidence, which is a number, yeah, so if uh, y is a fixed uh, uh, data set, then of course it has a probability density, a marginal probability density under this probabilistic model, which we defined. It's just we, we defined a probability distribution, and then of course uh, the, um, there's a marginal um, probability density or probability mass for uh, some observed data. Um, and that's a number that's uh, regardless of the dimensionality of y, this is a scalar number. And uh, we um, take the log of it, which of course uh, implies that um, the um, the density is not uh, zero, um, but um, that's then, I guess, the assumption. So one might actually 
if one would do this probably mathematically, one would have to exclude the possibility that the density of uh, something is uh, zero, otherwise it doesn't work with the log. Um, and this number, um, so for example, 2.7 um, can be written um, always um, as a sum of two things, namely um, the uh, elbow, so the evidence lower bound, um, which is a function um, for, for a fixed probabilistic model, which is a function of QZ and the KL divergence between QZ and um, the conditional distribution of Z given Y, so the posterior distribution. The question is, of course, so, so basically this is a number and this is also a number. I think I also have a picture of that. Let's look at a picture of that. So um, this is a picture of that here. This uh, bar uh, denotes um, the log model evidence. So a number like 2.7. And um, this can be split additively into this elbow term and to the KL divergence term. So if this is 2.7 here, this bar, and maybe this is 2.5 and this is 2.2. And together they're 2.7. So they have formed this um, um, log model evidence. The question is, of course, what are these elbows and what are, is the KL divergence? Um, that's, uh, these are defined here and they are defined in terms of improper integrals. So here we have uh, integrals. The elbow is defined um, as follows. Um, in a way, it's uh, defined as the expectation of this term here um, with respect to QZ. What is this term here? That's the log um, of um, the joint uh, probability of Y and Z divided by QZ. Um, so if um, Y is um, fixed, then of um, so in some observed uh, um, data, if y is fixed, and this is of um, of course the y that we are interested in here, then um, the only thing that is integrated here over is z, and um, then this comes out as a, a number. The question is of course why is it defined like that, um, and what can we do with it? But we will get to that. Um, and um, this elbow evidence lower bound, um, which yeah takes on, uh, um, and this is actually what I uh, uh, earlier referred to as a, a functional. This takes in a probability density function, so it takes in a function, uh, and uh, gives you back a number. So it um, is. Um, is what is what you can call a functional in modern uh, language this is just a function it just has a function as an input argument um, and um, this is called evidence lower bound or in, or variation of free energy or just free energy don't ever go down the route of asking yourself what does this have to do with energy, like physics energy, or what does this have to do with free energy in a physics route? There is no point in going down that route. You can do that, um, but that will lead you uh, to something interesting uh, where you can point out uh, interesting uh, commonalities between um, um, yeah, physics models of describing the world and information theoretic models, which uh, we have here, or, or probabilistic models that are used for statistical inference. That's interesting, but you don't gain any understanding of variational inference from trying to understand the uh, physics energy meaning of this whole thing. So this is why I and uh, basically everyone uh, went away from calling this thing free energy and just called it evidence lower bound because evidence is something that we have uh, in here that's called evidence. And um, why it's a lower bound, we will see in a second. Um, but there's no point in trying to yeah, relate this to energy and heat and, and so on. 
you can do that. It's interesting. It's a nice art thing, but it will not uh, deepen your understanding of uh, using variational inference um, for data analysis or as a or for a variational autoencoding or for the free energy principle also the free energy principle the free energy in there this is not some physics uh, um, energy stuff this is uh, probabilistic modeling this is information theoretic quantities just want to point out that so that's why i call this elbow evidence law bound and every every reasonable person these days calls this elbow um so that's that's that, that thing what we can do with it uh, and why this holds we'll see in a second the second thing is the kl divergence which you may have heard uh, before because kl divergence uh, show up in many places um so the kl divergent is also a functional it's actually a function of two functions namely in this case the variational distribution and, um, and this conditional distribution and it's defined as you see here um, so it's again an integral, improper integral um, expectation with respect to the um, um, variational distribution and of this term, the log of the um, ratio of um, QZ and PZ given Y. And um, that's called KL divergence. It's, we will talk a little bit more about it. It's a measure of the dissimilarity between this distribution over Z and this distribution over Z. So for example, if QZ equals uh, PZ given Y, um, so if this is the uh, same density, then the KL divergence is zero. And if they are not the same, then the KL divergence is larger than zero. The QZ um, distributions, they um, usually also come in, in terms of um, probability density functions. And then they, of course, also have parameters. And um, I sometimes refer to them or usually refer to them as variational parameters so that it's clear, clear which parameters uh, we talk about. Yeah, so that's this log model evidence uh, decomposition. The first question is, of course, why it holds. Um, and it holds because the things are defined as they are defined here. So this is um, why um, this holds. So here's the proof. Um, so we start with the definition of the elbow. Um, let's say we define this here and we will define this quantity, um, so this integral. Then we can write this integral um, by first using the definition of conditional probability um, as pz given y times py. That's the same thing as this. Um, then we can use um, the property that the logarithm turns uh, um, products into sums um, and um, that uh, sums uh, in integrals or that integrals behave linearly or, are, um, or have the linearity probability. So we can um, um, you know, we can um, make a sum out of this product here and um, and uh, then split the integral. So we have QZ ln PY, so this part, um, plus QZ ln PZ uh, divided by QZ. So we split this PY times PZ uh, uh, given Y uh, divided by QZ. And then um, we have these two integrals and uh, we can uh, have a look at it. Um, here we have an integral where we have uh, the log of um, PY, which is uh, does not depend on the integration constant. So we can take it out. So we have um, the log of PY times uh, QZ times, uh, sorry, the log of PY times the integral of um, uh, QZ. And we have um, here we, um, uh, use the property of the logarithm that um, ratios um, and um, 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 and um, uh, let's see here. Uh, ratios and sub. Uh, uh, if you do, the property that we use here is that if you um, switch around uh, a denominator and numerator in a logarithm, um, the sign of um, this expression changes. But this is um, essentially the same thing as um, um, 
the fact that ratios uh, amount uh, ratios in logarithms amount to um, differences. So um, essentially, the only thing that's uh, happening here is that we use the definition of conditional probability, we use the prob probabilities of the logarithm, and we use the linearity of um, um, integrals. So things that you all learn in the uh, Oh, well, the, except for this, uh, you learn in the pre-course in psychology, so nothing uh, too fancy. Um, and um, then we are here. This part here is already the KL divergence. So this is defined as the KL divergence. This is this thing. And um, here um, we integrate um, a probability density function. And by definition, probability density function or probability mass function, if we replace the integral by a sum sign, and we are for some reason dealing with probability mass function, um, they sum to one. So this integral goes to one. So we have logarithm um, py minus the KL divergence. And then um, we just uh, yeah, can add the KL divergence on the other side, and then we are here. So this is uh, yeah, the crucial uh, evidence, um, log model evidence decomposition. Of course, we don't know yet what we can use it for, um, but um, it's fairly easy to see that it holds. And the reason why it hold, holds essentially is because we define um, the elbow um, in this way. Um, and the KL divergence is also defined in this way. So this is why this works. Good, a question so far to this uh, evidence decomposition? Apparently not. Um, so we don't know yet what we can do with it and also not what these things actually measure. And the first thing that we should think about uh, in terms of what these things measure is the KL divergence. If you have seen it before, um, you might already know what it is. Um, if you have not seen it before, then uh, you learn about it now. Um, so here we're considering the kuhlberg leiber divergence per se, um, which is a um, if we look at um, it as a function of PDFs, it's a function of two um, inputs, Q, um, two probability densities, um, which I call QZ here, PZ, uh, on the same random variable. So that's always the um, that's a found that's always assumed. It has this uh, notation with this double bar. That's just uh, it's this double bar doesn't show up anywhere else in math, uh, but uh, it still shows up here in this uh, KL divergence. I think at one point we might just uh, switch to a comma here. Um, the KL divergence uh, yeah, has been proposed uh, by Kuhlberg Leibler in the 50s uh, as a measure of uh, dissimilarities between. Uh, probability um, densities. It's um, if you know what a metric is, uh, it's not a metric. A metric is a proper distance function that fulfills uh, uh, the thing of um, now what are these things? So first of all, it's always uh, a metric so, or a distance function always has the property that if um, the inputs are the same, then um, it's uh, the dis the metric is uh, zero. Um, so, for example, if you look at the distance of two points in space, if uh, the two points are the same, then uh, the distance between these two points is zero. Um, then a metric fulfills the um, fact that the distances are always positive. So. Um, yeah, you measure in a way uh, absolute uh, distances, not uh, relative, um, negative, or, or positive. Um, and um, then distances, um, if you measure distances in the real world, they're always symmetric. So if you go from A to B, it's the same as going from B to A. Um, in this regard, the KL divergence is different um, because the KL divergence is not symmetric. Um, especially not, also not as it is used here in um, variational inference. However, the original um, um, proposal of the KL diversion was actually to use it as a, a metric 
by using uh, one half of both uh, forms uh, of the KL divergence, so QZ uh, to PZ and PZ to QZ. Um, that just as a side note. Um, and then um, uh, for proper distance functions, there's also the triangle inequality. So it's always uh, the shorter distance is always uh, the direct way between two points and not going via a third point. Um, which is, I think, also doesn't hold for the KL divergence uh, per se. But two things hold, and that's important. Uh, namely, if um, the uh, PDFs are identical, so if QZ equals PZ, then the KL divergence between these PDFs is zero. And if they are not the same, then the KL divergence is larger uh, than zero. Um, here um, is an example for KL divergences between univariate Gaussians. Um, so here we have um, two Gaussians um, where I called the random variable x. This is some uh, old uh, slide which I didn't want to. Uh, um, it's a nice MATLAB figure and to get such a nice figure out of R is, is a pain, but um, at one point I will get it. Um, so here we have uh, the KL divergence between two um, univariate Gaussian PDFs, um, one with the parameters mu q and sigma square q, and uh, the other one with uh, parameters uh, mu p and sigma square p. And um, what I uh, do here is that I fix one of them. So this uh, first PDF is fixed at uh, zero and one. Um, and then I look at uh, the value of the KL divergence if the um, um, if I change the parameters of this second um, density. So the first thing here is um, so the blue curve uh, here is always the um, um, then the Gaussian centered on zero and with um, slight deviation one. So that's the blue curve here. Now, if they are very um, um, close to each other, um, so if the parameters of um, the second one are very close to each other, they obviously look quite alike. Um, and um, the KL divergence um, is shown here as this um, um, red dot. Um, so here, um, the parameters that you see here are the ones of the red curve. And um, it's then the KL divergence with respect to um, the blue curve, which is not shown here. It's just the parameters of the red curve because there are two parameters, namely the variance parameter and the expectation parameter. And if they are very close to um, the, the blue curve here, so zero and one, um, then the KL divergence is very small. Now, if you uh, uh, here, I increase the uh, distance in terms of um, the expectation parameter. So um, the expectation parameter of uh, the first one is still zero, but the expectation of the other one is uh, 1.6. So that's uh, what's happening here. Um, so uh, here, the variance of um, the P thing here is still one um, and um, the expectation parameter is 1.6. So we get a high uh, KL divergence. If um, the expectation parameter is held constant, but the um, variance is changed, then also the KL divergence increases, but it doesn't increase that much. So the um, so it also increases. You can see that here. So that's uh, the darkest bit. And is, if you go away from that, um, in, the, um, in terms of the variance parameter, it increases. But of course, um, a stronger dissimilarity is uh, invoked um, by changing the mean. Um, so, um, and one can of course debate whether that's awesome or not, but that's uh, how um, the Kyle divergence quantifies the difference between two Gaussian densities. So that's the Kyle divergence. Um, any questions about the Kyle divergence right now? Okay, and then I think it's uh, already time for a first break. So the, I don't think we will have time or I don't want to spend time necessarily uh, on um, discussing why um, the KL divergence works. Um, 
so this, these two properties that it's larger than zero if they are not the same, the two input distributions or two input PDFs, um, and it's zero if they are the same. Um, essentially, this follows uh, from Jensen's inequality, um, which is an inequality, um, yeah, essentially about expectations if you want or um, yeah, it's this inequality and with the help of Jensen's inequality one can show that the chi divergence uh, properties hold the question is then why does Jensen's inequality hold and, and this is a um, yeah, um, partial proof uh, let's say for uh, Jensen's inequality um, so the it's quite crucial so this is why i um, worked out <laughs> some stuff there um, because the whole variational inference uh, business works because of this non-negativity property of chi divergence so the chi divergence is never ne negative it's only zero uh, or positive and that's why variational inference works as we will see um, so the question is of course so why is the KL divergence never negative and this then relates to Jensen's inequality and then of course the question is why does Jensen's inequality hold um, and um, in the end uh, it's a property of uh, uh, convex uh, functions um, or concave functions the logarithm is concave, but that's uh, minus the logarithm. Uh, the negative logarithm is uh, convex. Okay, um, then uh, I think uh, let's uh, take a break here, and then after um, the break, uh, discuss why, what. Uh, now that we know, okay, the KL divergence is uh, always zero if they have the, if they are the same, or larger than zero if they are different. Still, why this evidence decomposition is of any value and of any interest to anyone. Okay, uh, let's have a break and continue uh, at 10. Um, Dirk, sorry, yep. uh, couldn't you just say then um, that it just simply, so from a naive point of view, that it, that it just measures sort of like the amount of dissimilarity. And since this is either zero or, you know, larger, because it can be in two directions uh, dissimilar, uh, from each other that this is the reason why it's never negative <laughs> uh no you can't say that i mean uh, so that's the right intuition but you can't say that yeah, from, from, never... an intu from an intuitive point of view yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. from an intuitive point of view you can sure. say you can say yeah because it measures this uh, absolute dissimilarity it's never negative but that's not <laughs> that's a uh, uh, yeah. sure from math ma from a mathematical standpoint of course uh, yeah. That's, I know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, from an intuitive viewpoint, <laughs> way if intuition is like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's like almost like a tautology because, yeah, anyway. Good. Yeah. Let's have a break and then continue five minutes after. Okay. So we have seen, and I told you that. Um, we are dealing with a probabilistic model. We want to find the posterior distribution and we want to find the model evidence. And in the variation inference setting, we capitalize on um, the log model evidence decomposition, which we have yeah, established. And we've seen so far that, um, first of all, it holds, and it's not, easy, uh, not that difficult to show that it holds, um, and that the KL divergence um, is a measure of dissimilarity between the, its two input um, probability density functions, and in particular that it is always non-negative. So it's e either zero if um, qz equals pz given y. So if qz is the um, posterior distribution density, um, then the KL divergence is zero. And if it's not the posterior um, density, the KL divergence is positive. Um, so the question then is how this can be used. And um, to do that, um, the first thing is to establish now also the name of the elbow um, as evidence lower bound question is why it's called evidence lower bound and the answer is it's called evidence lower bound because um, 
it's uh, always um, smaller or equal to um, the log model evidence. Um, so um, this inequality holds. So the elbow is, is e either um, equal to the log model evidence. So that's the equality or it's smaller than it. So if you increase the elbow, the largest you will ever get um, is as large as um, the log model evidence. Why does that hold? Um, well, that uh, is the con this is uh, a direct consequence of this uh, non-negativity of the Chi divergence um, and this evidence uh, log model evidence decomposition. Uh, the log model evidence is always the sum of these two terms, and this term is always either zero, then the equality holds, um, or it's larger than zero. And if it's larger than zero. Um, uh, then this uh, thing must be smaller than this because you add something to it uh, and then you get um, this uh, quantity. So for example, if the, uh, if the log model evidence is four, um, this can be zero, then the elbow is also four um, or it's larger than zero, for example, one, then the elbow is three and hence smaller than the log model evidence. That's uh, why it's called evidence lower bound. And it's a good name <laughs> because it's not confusing as variation of free energy. So there um, are, um, the, yeah, there's again this, um, this visualization. Um, this is always a positive um, thing. Um, and um, so that's the decomposition. So now um, the question is, uh, what can one do with this um, fact? And how can one use uh, all of this to um, do inference in a probabilistic model? And one way that I also hinted already at is, um, okay, we have this KL divergence. Um, let's minimize it um, with respect to uh, QZ. So P, and, and this is now what where you again need to, um, yeah, on the one hand, um, appreciate that, but then on the other hand, it also works. If it works, what I want to say is, we want to find a PZ given Y, but of course the assumption is a little bit again, that it's hard to evaluate this. So if um, we would just be able to do it in a conjugate model, um, I didn't say that this morning, but if we have a conjugate model and we can readily find um, the other conditional distribution, so PZ given Y, like we did for the better binomial and for the Gaussian Gaussian, then of course we don't need all of this. Um, so um, on the other hand, this is a special case of this scenario, then because if we can uh, set QZ to PZ, because we have a formula to compute uh, PZ given Y, like we have for the posterior um, distribution in the better uh, model or for the posterior Gaussian distribution in the Gaussian model, like we saw yesterday, um, then we can set uh, QZ to that. Then the KL divergence is zero and our elbow is just the log model evidence. and um, we are uh, essentially um, done. So the idea is that, um, and of course we we can we don't need to think about variational inference in this case. So um, the idea here is again, of course, that the conditional density is not that easy to evaluate, and we somehow want to approximate it. And uh, here we approximate it um, with this um, variational distribution, which is just a distribution over Z, like the conditional distribution here is just a distribution over Z. And um, one way then to use this evidence um, decomposition and the elbow uh, property is to minimize the Kyle divergence. So um, yeah, somehow to do something here. The problem is, of course, um, we don't really know um, how we want to minimize that if we can't uh, evaluate this. So if we don't know this one argument and then we want to change this argument, but we're not really sure what this is, it's tricky. Um, however, so if 
in maybe a scenario we already know the conditional distribution, which would be weird. And, but anyway, uh, we would uh, know it. Uh, we we knew it. Then um, we could do that. Um, and the elbow would uh, take on the value of the log model evidence. The much more uh, relevant uh, approach here is um, doing things the other way around, namely um, leaving this in a way uh, on its own, but maximizing um, this part. So to increase the evidence lower bound as a function of QZ. So the evidence lower bound, again, let's have a look at how it's defined. Um, the evidence lower bound is defined in terms of the joint distribution, which we know um, because we define our probabilistic model. We define the likelihood y given z and pz. So we know that because we defined it, we invented it. And um, then the elbow becomes a function of um, this qz probability density function. So we can change qz um, because um, yeah, we want to do something. So we change uh, qz around. Or if qz is a um, parametric density, like most of the time, um, for example, a Gaussian, we change the parameters of this um, uh, density to um, increase um, the elbow. Because what happens if we increase the elbow is that this quantity is always fixed. So that's um, the density of a given data point under this probabilistic model. Um, that's just a number that's fixed. And if we now increase the elbow, um, this will decrease the KL divergence. Um, and um, that's and this evidence decomposition still holds. So the length of this bar will always stay the same, but we will shift this uh, vertical bar here to the right, which has two implications. First of all, our evidence lower bound, if we increase it, will become uh, more and more similar to um, the log uh, model evidence. So the uh, elbow will, if we increase it, um, at maximum reach uh, the value of the log model evidence. And at the same time, as we shift this uh, bar here over there, so that elbow becomes LNPY, uh, the KL divergence decreases um, because this evidence decomposition must hold, which also means that um, the um, QZ distribution, so um, the distribution that we use um, or that we shift around to um, increase the elbow becomes more and more similar to the posterior distribution to this conditional because the KL divergence between those um, decreases. So, um, and that's the uh, main idea of variational inference um, to, um, yeah, start with some distribution that we, um, that, for example, could be the prior distribution, can be something else, but it could be the prior distribution, and then change this distribution uh, in such a way that first of, that the elbow increases. Um, and this has then two implications. Uh, if we cannot further increase the elbow, then the elbow um, um, is our best approximation to the log model evidence. And um, the um, distribution for this converged value of the elbow is um, closest to the posterior um, as we uh, as close as uh, to the posterior as we can get. So, um, yeah, I think we need the mean field for that first because the question is: okay, that's now the idea, but how do we do it, and what's what are the typical things? Is that clear? So do you have um, um, questions about this? Apparently not. Um, of course, this can be easier or less easy um, depending on the dimensionality of Z. So, and um, and also the question is, of course, how do we maximize a functional? So how do we maximize a function with respect to a function? Um, there are um, 
yeah so there are then a couple of terms and a, a couple of principles which are then also important in the context of variational inference and um, the first uh, idea is um, to um, use something that is called mean field variation approximation which um, relates to the fact that um, or is so interesting under the assumption that um, Z, uh, so this random entity uh, Zeta, um, is not univariate but uh, higher dimensional. So it has, um, um, it can be decomposed into. Um, mutually exclusive subsets so the notation is maybe not that important here but um, there are at least um, two sets so our z um, maybe um, are five variables and we can um, split this into the first three and the uh, uh, second two and um, then here our, our number of sets would be two and uh, our z uh, s1 would be uh, one, two, three, and our uh, S uh, our S two would be two, three. So we split um, the uh, entire set of latent variables, um, of course, assuming that there's more than one, um, into um, two or more sets. So here there are two. Um, scenarios discussed in more detail. One is that we um, split uh, the set of um, latent variables into um, um, all individual sets so that we have um, a variational distribution for each of the parts of Z or each of the components of Z. The other one would be that we um, split it into two sets. Um, so like I said, for example, the first three and the second two. So what's an application one has in mind there? For example, if you think back, and this is also what we look at in the afternoon or let's say uh, in the application uh, uh, side of things if you think again about the gaussian the gaussian um that we, where we wanted to do inference yesterday it has an expectation parameter and has a variance parameter and yesterday i showed you the gaussian gaussian model where they um, we did inference for the expectation parameter but of course uh, it felt a little bit unnaturalistic from a one sample t test perspective and so on that uh, to assume that the variance parameter is known so in a variational setting of course, also in other settings, but in a variational setting, we would have two latent uh, variables, two parameters, uh, which we model as random variables, like always in uh, Bayesian inference, namely mu and sigma square. And uh, then um, a mean field approximation um, here would be um, to split this two-dimensional um, parameter vector or this two-dimensional latent uh, random vector mu sigma square into um, two things, mu and sigma square, and assume um, independence uh, in the variational distribution for them. So we have here q mu and here q sigma square. And actually full factorization in this case is the same. So um, that would also then be q mu and q sigma square. Um, so this is um, a simplification um, that of course neglects then potential non-independence uh, independencies in the um, conditional um, distribution. So in the real conditional distribution of a um, probabilistic model that we cannot evaluate, um, this um, conditional, there might not be a conditional um, independence between the parts of Z. So it might not hold that um, PZ given Y is the same as the product of um, PZ I uh, given Y over all components of I if we have full factorization or a binary factorization. This might not hold, but in this sense, it's also um, here, of course, an approximation. So um, and that's then the thing with approximations. They are approximations. They are not uh, the real thing. If the real thing would be easily evaluated, we would easily evaluate it, and then we would have the real thing. But um, here, um, of course, the idea is to approximate things. And um, the approximation um, then that is chosen is this factorization over parts of Z. For example, 
the expectation parameter and the variance parameter of a caution. What can that be used for? Uh, used for? Um, it can be used for um, what is called freeform mean field variational inference. There are two forms of uh, variational inference, um, starting from what we've seen before. So one is fixed form variational inference. There, the idea is to um, use um, um, as variational distributions a specific class of distributions, regardless of um, the probabilistic model and uh, see what's happening. And the other uh, form of um, variational inference is free form mean field variational inference that um, lets the variational distributions be determined um, by the entire um, setting. So um, free form mean field variational inference um, is interesting. It's if you want to do it, it's um, quite analytically demanding because uh, what uh, free form mean field variational inference tells you is okay, you can do, you can increase the elbow as a function of um, QZ um, using what is uh, called these days uh, coordinate ascent variational inference. Um, Kavi. Um, and Kavi works as follows. Um, you assume um, at least here a binary factorization, um, which then renders the elbow um, a function of the first set and the second set, uh, or the first uh, probability density over the first set of latent variables and uh, the second probability density over the second set of uh, vari variables. And then you um, increase um, the elbow first with respect to the first um, set and then with respect to the second set. The question is, how do you do this? Um, uh, how, how do you maximize the elbow um, with respect to a given set uh, of variables or with a, a given set of or with a given probability density, I should always say, uh, over a set of the variables. And the answer is this uh, free form mean field variational inference theorem that says, okay, if you uh, now split QZ into um, at least two um, um, distributions, one over a set S and the other one over a set uh, without S. So for example, um, as we will also see later in the Gaussian, uh, you have Q over um, mu sigma square, but you split it into uh, two independent uh, contributions, Q mu and Q sigma square. Then um, you maximize the evidence lower bound with respect to Q mu, let's say, by setting Q mu to one over some uh, constant uh, that doesn't depend on S times the exponential of this integral. And what is this integral? Here you integrate um, this, um, again, the probabilistic uh, model density that you defined with respect to the other um, variational density. Yeah, um, and that, and that's the theorem that maximizes uh, the evidence lower bound with respect to uh, the first uh, factor here. And then you can exchange uh, um, the s and the without s uh, part, so mu and sigma square, and uh, then um, use your current uh, knowledge about or your current uh, form of Q mu, so uh, QS, and use this again. So um, maybe it's a little bit confusing if I always refer to mu and stuff, maybe it's nicely shown here. Um, yeah, so um, here, this is what we then look at later. Actually, sigma square is um, treated as lambda, so one over sigma square, and here you see this factorization. We will see that again, but that's, um, uh, what I was always referring to. The question is, of course, why? Why does uh, this uh, setting uh, a part of um, this um, variation distribution to this 
why does this maximize the elbow? Um, and there are different ways to show that. Um, so this is also known as the uh, fundamental theorem of variational calculus, I believe, because um, it's if you um, if you look into variational calculus, um, this is also a standard procedure to um, um, yeah in, um, get to the minimum of a um, of a function. So that is essentially very similar to this condition of that the first derivative uh, is zero, and then you solve uh, in calculus. One can, and this is what I meant earlier. However, also show that uh, this works without. Uh, talking about variational calculus at all. And um, this works uh, by with the following um, idea or the following um, proof. Um, if you have a mean field approximation, so QZ, you split into QZS and QZ without S, so um, some latent variables and the other uh, latent variables, then um, you can rewrite the elbow as the chiral divergence, as the negative chiral divergence, sorry, between um, QS and this term here. Um, and um, this term here, this term um, is, of course, uh, just exactly this term here. Um, so here you have the chiral divergence between QS and um, the term we will um, set things to. And now um, if you, and this is the negative chiral divergence, so this is either something fairly negative. So if the chiral divergence is positive, uh, sorry, if the chiral divergence is yeah, positive or not zero, then this is something like the chiral dimension, something like five. And uh, here you have uh, then the minus sign in front of it. So you have minus five, the chiral dimension is zero, you have zero. Um, there is another constant term, but this doesn't depend on uh, um, QS. So if you set QZS to this term here, then the KL divergence vanishes, so it goes to zero. And um, then the elbow um, takes the largest value uh, that it can take as a function of uh, QZS. Because if you don't set it uh, to this, then um, the KL divergence is positive. And because there's a minus sign in front of it, uh, the elbow is always um, relatively small. And then uh, if you set QZS to this thing, then it uh, the KL diversion goes away. Uh, it's zero, and you only have this term that you always have, um, but which you can't change by changing uh, QZS anyway. So, um, of course, this again then rests on the fact that you can actually rewrite the elbow in this form. Um, so as a, this KLL divergent minus some constant. And if you can do that, then uh, it's uh, yeah clear that uh, if you set QZS to it, that, that uh, you maximize the elbow. And why and how this can be rewritten, that's uh, what's happening on these two slides. Um, yeah, I don't think we want to go over that. Um, so essentially, again, this is very similar to you, uh, to first establishing the um, log uh, evidence, um, the log model evidence decomposition in the first place. It uses the properties of the logarithm and the linearity of integrals all the time, and the fact that you uh, that um, probability density functions integrate to one. So that's the only thing that happens here. It's just uh, some algebra. Um, and ends up um, after some reformulation and uh, putting things into constants, it ends up with the KL divergence between QZ and exactly this term here uh, and some constants. And um, so this reformulation, um, you can trace there. Um, and if this reformulation holds and you believe that it holds, then uh, it's clear that this um, maximizes the elbow. 
And the nice thing about this whole thing is that uh, one doesn't need uh, to work with variational calculus to show that this actually maximizes um, the elbow with respect to one of the densities in a mean field um, um, decomposition of the um, variational distribution. Um, yeah. So maybe before questions, that's then how uh, an algorithm that uses this works. Um, so that's what uh, people call CAVI uh, this, these days, coordinate ascent variational inference. So we start with a probabilistic model comprising observable random variables yeah, and latent random variables. And um, we note uh, we uh, have SQZ, a variation uh, distribution, and we assume that it factorizes in a binary manner um, so that we have QZ S and QZ without S. So for example, Q mu and Q sigma square. Um, then this algorithm known as KV maximizes the evidence lower bound. We start with some distributions um, that um, yeah we just start with. So this is then numerical optimization. We need some starting points. Um, for example, um, their respective uh, marginal distributions in the probabilistic model, which we know because we um, defined them. Um, and um, then we um goes um yeah in this iterative procedure of course it always helps to evaluate the elbow um because we also want the uh, value of the elbow in the end because we want um, an approximation of the log model evidence um but um to maximize the elbow then iteratively we um first update the distribution over uh, zs by evaluating this thing here so um where we have a q uh, um, Z without S, we have it from the, in the um, initialization. Um, if I is one, and then we get uh, I, uh, or when I, yeah, if I is, and we start in zero here. So if um, I is zero, our um, Q one Z S, we get from the Q uh, zero of Z without S and our probabilistic model. So everything here is um, um, well defined. And then we have an update for QZS, and we use that uh, here to then update QZ um, without S. And then it, it's, it's a good idea to monitor um, the elbow, see that it increases, and um, then um, do that again. So if you have seen expectation maximization, this is not uh, unlike expectation maximization, but it's actually um, also not the same as expectation maximization because um, these are both maximization steps. Um, but one can show that expectation maximization is a special case of, of um, um, this. Um, so that is of course, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's more a general principle because yes, okay, I know I have to do this, okay, but okay, here I have to um, form an integral. So where do I get this integral from? What's, what, what happens here? And this is then the analytical work that uh, goes into the derivation of um, such an algorithm. Um, and this is also why, um, this uh, um, this form of variational inference is not that elite, uh, is not that admired or appreciated by everyone because um, it's it works. It's a principle, but if you apply it to a given model, you have to do qu quite some analytical work. You have to evaluate a lot of integrals, and then the so basically using math <laughs> or uh, somehow differently but it's uh, it's not something that although it's a the idea works it's not something that tells you exactly uh, what to do uh, for a given model you have to do something yourself <laughs> and derive something yourself so here's again the uh, 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 visualization of that so the idea is that we have this um factorization and on 
uh, the iteration on, on each iteration, we first increase the elbow with respect to the first thing. So our bar here goes a little bit higher um, and uh, the KL divergence um, gets a little bit slower, uh, uh, lo lower. And um, then we increase with respect to the uh, other one. And of course we can only push that that far because um, or it depends uh, it really depends then um, on how far we can push this so how small we can make the KL divergence um, it really depends on um, for example um, on what the true um, independence or non-independence properties of the latent variables um, conditional distribution is because these will never be uh, there will no there won't be any dependence in there and if there's also no dependence in in there then yeah we might be able to uh, get the kl divergence to, to zero but if there are dependencies in the posterior so conditional dependencies um, then we will never get there and this is then one thing that um, um, one can show, of course, in models where one knows this, that this works very well and um, that this um, also um, works exactly. So um, that um, for models that are of that uh, conditional independence form in the posterior, um, this can work exactly. But in other models where one has no idea about what this actually is, and this is why one is using this, it's also not that easy to then um, figure out how close one is. So um, is the elbow um, almost there or is it uh, uh, quite far? And that's then where interesting research uh, starts um, to uh, work with that. But of course the hope is that in the end after using many iterations or at least some iterations until things have converged, so if nothing changes anymore, that um, the elbow is roughly the uh, log model evidence and the product of these distributions is roughly the um, conditional, um, so the posterior distribution. Yeah, so that's uh, free form mean field variational inference and we will look uh, at an example for this however so we will look at freeform variational inference for the uh, glm however we will, will not look into its derivation because i mean yeah we could <laughs> but then we would still sit here on sunday um, the example that we will look at here is uh, from a paper by will penny on variational Bayesian inference for um, fmi time series from 2003 where they derived um, the specific um, freeform variational inference and it uh, involves a lot of uh, integration forming integrals um, yeah so questions about this right now Yes, um, so we are looking at the probability density function QZ all the time, and then in the in the Calvi algorithm, um, we use, or it can be uh, to approximate QZ, the initial uh, values for QZ, um, uh, and slide 22. Um, so the, the initial value is uh, can be set. So you say one example would be to set it over uh, PZ, the integral over PZ. Uh, my question is, what exactly is the difference between QZ and PZ? Oh, yeah, that's uh, important difference. Um, uh, so PZ is um, the. Let's go all the way back. Um, PZ is the uh, prior, right? Yeah. So that's the marginal that we um, define in the very beginning. Um, and then the question is how, so of, obviously we use QZ to um, approximate the posterior. Um, the question is um, how do we initialize this? Because in this uh, algorithm, like everywhere, like, you know, from numerical maximum likelihood uh, estimation, we first need some value and um, one way to do that or i mean is to set it essentially to the prior because why not i mean <laughs> one has to start somewhere and uh, the so like uh, in a, in 
a naive thing is to say, okay, um, we now have our data, we know what our prior is. Now we want to uh, approximate the conditionals or the posterior. Um, let's start with the prior. However, one has to be a little bit careful there that one doesn't get confused. Um, so um, it's not that really the prior is then suddenly QZ or something like that. It's just that um, the prior, uh, if this, for example, like yesterday is a Gaussian with, um, um, let's say, expectation parameter zero and variance parameter 10 or something like that, then um, the first uh, um, um, variational distribution would be then a Gaussian distribution with exactly these parameters. And um, then um, the update um, would be um, 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 no, now I lost my sentence. Uh, so this would be, so if, if we have only one uh, parameter, uh, P mu, uh, then the Q, first QZ would use the same parameters. So essentially, and this is what we will then also see, uh, what these updates refer to are updates of the parameters. So these things that look uh, like, uh, yeah, you have to compute integrals, they come down to uh, updating the parameters of the respective distributions. And um, that's, uh, um, I think, um, where you, what you referred to. Um, that's the idea, but it's not that you change the prior. This is uh, what uh, one has to be a little bit uh, careful. Um, so the probabilistic model is always fixed one, and the PZ is always fixed. One just um, starts the updating, for example, uh, using the prior distribution, but you could use any distribution. And um, uh, it's also, um, of course, some people prefer um, random starting points like in numerical optimization. And uh, of course, you can also start with a random um, um, uh, distribution. It's actually not that well understood, I think, um, what's, what's a good starting point. And I also found that, um, strangely enough, sometimes uh, if you use this approach, starting from the prior, will first decrease your variational free energy and then will uh, increase things. And that's, yeah, research. Did that answer the question a little bit? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, other questions? So we will look at an example for that after um, the break. And before we um, do that, I think I will also switch the schedule a little bit. Um, before we do that, I want to mention fixed form variational inference. Um, that's in a way less analytically demanding um, because one doesn't has one doesn't have to figure out these kind of things. Um, so one doesn't have to figure out these integrals and um, so on. However, one also has to figure out something. And that's also, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what, but, but the good thing is one also has, only has to figure out one thing. So the idea of fixed form variational inference is not to obtain the um, functional form of these uh, distributions um, from this setting here. And maybe when I told you just uh, that it becomes parameter update equation, yes, it becomes parameter update equations, but actually on the first iteration of thinking this algorithm through, you actually discover of what functional form your uh, uh, approximation is. Um, this then works fairly similar to what we've seen uh, yesterday with respect to um, the better posterior and the Gaussian posterior and the better binomial and the Gaussian Gaussian model, where we also started some uh, calculations and then we saw, oh, this looks like a um, better 
uh, distribution. If we normalize it like that, or this looks like uh, after completing the square, this looks like a Gaussian distribution. So that's um, this is kind of also uh, one of the essence es essential features of this freeform thing. That's why it's also called freeform because you don't say uh, my um, variational distribution should be of a specific form. This is also maybe why I also why this was a, is a little bit misleading with this uh, thing here um, that you initials like uh, initial. Uh, it like that um, but on the other hand um, you have to yeah in, in, in real life this comes down to parameter update equations um, so um, the other way to do it then instead of uh, be the being given the functional form so the type of distribution from these updates is um, actually to say from the very beginning okay my variational distributions i use gaussians for them regardless of the probabilistic model whatever probabilistic model i have whether there are gaussians in there or not um, i approximate the uh, posterior with um, a gaussian distribution so and um, that means um, that one also does know um, essentially everything in the definition of the elbow. So um, the elbow um, was defined or is defined as this, um, I mean, that's the same elbow as we always uh, saw. Um, um, like that. Um, if we um, fix the form of the variational distribution, so this then goes, this is a little bit different to the variational calculus uh, um, idea of um, finding the function that maximizes something. Here it's uh, more than finding the parameters that do something, because if we fix this uh, form, then um, we can. Um, evaluate this um, integral and turn this elbow um, that is a function of a density into um, a function that is a function of parameters, um, so of numbers or of vectors, um, and get into standard numerical optimization. Um, so that's, um, if you look into the free energy principle literature, that's what um, yeah, Carl called um, Laplace, um, so variational Laplace, also Jean Denisot uh, uh, calls it variational Laplace. And um, yeah, most people then call it fixed form or um, using Gaussian variational distributions. The nice thing is that you, um, by doing this, you really, um, by assuming from the outset um, some functional form here, you get into the optimization literature and you get out of the variational calculus uh, business. So you don't uh, need to somehow, in terms of variational calculus, think about what kind of functional form falls out of this. And uh, I find this functional form by uh, forming this integral and so on. But um, you um, create a quantity just like um, the likelihood or the log likelihood function in numerical um, maximum likelihood or any kind of maximum likelihood um, that is a function of parameters of so numbers vectors of your variational distributions the only thing that you have to do there so is that you have to derive um, this um, form so you have to evaluate this integral here as a function of the um, variational parameters but in a way you have to do this once analytically or you do it uh, somehow approximately um, and um, then you can use numerical optimization to maximize the elbow as a function of parameters so it's um, that um, is and there are different perspectives on that um, so one so so the, the interesting where this helps a lot is if you have um, nonlinear um, 
uh, GLMs, <laughs> essentially. So in brain imaging, this is uh, heavily applied in things like dynamic causal modeling. Um, but you can apply it everywhere where you have um, a nonlinear transformation of your parameters um, and you uh, use Gaussian error terms, then um, one can evaluate this integral, however, using approximations, um, and then um, do numerical optimization to get the log model evidence and the uh, posterior densities. So that's variational Laplace. Um, we will not talk about it. If you're interested in that, uh, yeah, look into our 2016 paper on um, probabilistic delay differential equation modeling of EEG signals. This is basically following up the, all the variational Laplace work that the London people have done since 2005. Um, this is, yeah, it's, it's one of the things. And then, um, yeah, there are other ways in, so, uh, this is, so what we discussed so far and basically up to here, um, everyone agrees or everyone um, works on and I agree everyone agrees anyway but um, until here everybody starts from the same perspective so that's what all people say okay that's a good idea maximize the elbow but then how to maximize the elbow uh, things uh, explode and diverge and uh, all different forms uh, um, are possible so um so uh, as I said, we will look into freeform after the break and um, then the whole neuro imaging field is full of fixed form. If you look into the um, David Bly stuff, they then also use stochastic optimization uh, to increase the elbow and then they mix it in a way with um, uh, um, numeric integration using stochastic simulation like we saw yesterday. And then this explodes again and it gets uh, not that easy to get to grips of what a specific project of a specific person is doing but in a way that's fairly similar uh, like always when you can optimize something so the optimization literature is full of different uh, algorithms which are better in this scenario or that scenario so maybe it's also quite natural good so that's uh, um, i just want to essentially mention that there's also fixed form uh, variational inference because that's what you see in the free energy principle world most of the time but also in um, in um, data analytical um, settings. Okay, so the last thing that I want to do uh, is uh, show you then example uh, for this. Um, that's not that long because we won't do a derivation. So um, my suggestion is that um, we finish early today because we all want to finish and um, now take a break um maybe until quarter so how long do you want a break so uh, i'm happy with the break until 11:30, uh, and then do the last bit of the entire course uh, i can also do a longer break um, how do you feel so the options are 11:30. continue at 11:30 for now our lunch break so taking an early lunch break or uh, continuing at 12. Maybe eleven forty-five. Is this thing in between? Yeah, everyone agrees on eleven forty-five. Yeah, it's okay for me. Okay, then yes. uh, let's take a break and continue on eleven forty-five with then an application of this whole thing, so that you see also that it does something and how it looks in uh, a computer code for something that you of course all know very much and very well the general linear model so see you at 11 45. let's do a last session on bayesian inference um, with an application of very variational inference to the general linear model and yeah that's as i mentioned before the break um, that's one way to do variational inference. And um, there are many uh, different forms of how one might want to apply this principle of maximizing the evidence lower bound. 
and hence the literature is also not that easy to handle and there's a lot of stuff going on and uh, of course it's also the job of people for example in machine learning who do probabilistic modeling to always invent novel stuff uh, and in a way is then the job of uh, mathematicians uh, to figure out what of this of these inventions actually makes sense and uh, what's working well and um, yeah that's basically the story so um, i chose here an application to the glm which um, we actually also used in research because uh, sometimes i also used um, the stuff that i'm teaching in uh, research um, and this is an application of free form variation of inference to the general linear model and this is work uh, by will penny essentially from the early 2000s um, i will show you the paper later um, but that's um, yeah what we're going to discuss we need um, one more random variable for that um, because it will feature the gamma um, distribution um, again as we've seen now repeatedly uh, probability distributions are often uh, defined in terms of probability density or probability mass functions and um, this is again um, a random variable that um, is continuous so it has an outcome space uh, comprising the positive real numbers it's a little bit that's it's also limited in terms of um, its outcome space so it takes on uh, only positive values and it has a um, specific uh, parametric form which is given here it has two parameters alpha and beta of course these parameters are not related to the alpha and beta parameter of the beta distribution but um, nevertheless i call them here alpha and beta as well and um, they are uh, known as a shape and a scale parameter the gamma distribution is always a little bit annoying because there are two par uh, parameterizations around the shape and scale and the shape and rate parameterization if you go to the wikipedia side of the gamma distribution you find both of them next to each other and one always has to pay some attention with which one the one is actually dealing with so that doesn't make it as uh, yeah one always has to check where, what is actually implemented and which one but uh, in any case i'm looking at the um, uh, shape and scale parameter uh, parameterization um, the expected value of a, a gamma random variable is given by alpha times beta and the um, variance is i think alpha times beta squared um, the gamma distribution is actually something that is also uh, there in frequentist statistics um, because a specific gamma distribution with the parameters n over two and two um, is the chi-squared distribution which is of course the distribution of variance parameter estimates in frequentist statistics um, so for example um, the f statistic is a ratio of chi-squared uh, uh, distributed random variables or the t statistic is a ratio of a normally distributed random variable and a chi-squared random variable so the gamma distribution is not something now very specific to variational inference or something it features heavily in uh, frequentist statistics as well so how does that look and why do we want why are we talking about it um so one feature of the gamma distribution is that uh, as i already mentioned that it's um, defined as a continuous distribution only on the positive numbers um, and that makes it suitable as a distribution um, for variance parameters so you know that the variance parameter of the gaussian always uh, is positive and um, if you want to specify your uncertainty about this parameter um, it makes sense that you don't assign the probability to negative values of um, the variance parameter um, or let's say zero probability to that because otherwise that would be a little bit weird um, so yeah so that's where the gamma uh, distribution always pops up as a um, useful distribution or at least in Bayesian inference as a useful distribution to quantify uncertainty over positive parameters and then depending on um, its 
parameters. Um, of course, it looks different. Um, yeah, so that's the gamma distribution. There are different, uh, so the, it's not the only possible um, distribution to um, have a zero probability density on negative values and positive, um, or yeah, and positive uh, density on the positive numbers. So log normal is another option. So there are um, there are more things than the gamma distribution. Um, but of course, it's also in terms of its uh, parametric form has an exponential in there. And if you then put it together with a Gaussian, then you again can use these properties that if you multiply Gaussians that uh, you can add the arguments and so on. So uh, yeah. And yeah, I, I guess it's also from the exponential family. Um, I'm not into exponential family right now that much, but I think this is also one of the reasons why um, it's a useful parametric distribution in um, statistics. So that's the gamma distribution, and we want to use it as a um, as a quantification of uncertainty over a variance parameter. And as I mentioned a couple of times yesterday, there's uh, also the conjugate Gaussian gamma model. So if you um, yeah, open a Bayesian statistics book um, in terms of, uh, and then look into um, Bayesian inference for the Gaussian, where both the expectation parameter and the variance parameter are known, then um, you will also find the Gaussian gamma model in a conjugate setting, which is not the one that we are looking at here, but we still use the gamma um, distribution. So the model that we want to apply this to um, is the general linear model. Um, just as a gener um, generalization um, of what we've already seen also in this course. So uh, we had IID samples from the Gaussian. Uh, that's of course a special case of all the ones in the t-test um, design if you want um, that's a special case of the glm where the design matrix is just once and you just have one better parameter but um, if you um, i don't know who of you attended the first workshop uh, of this series uh, the cbbs graduate course series and that was of course devoted um, to the GLM and FMI. So whoever of you is working in new imaging will come across uh, the GLM. In the summer term in statistics, we do the GLM. And uh, if you ever seen multiple linear regression or simple linear regression, but other, I think it's more evident in multiple linear regression, then you have also seen the GLM. So I hope the GLM is nothing new to you. Um, if it is, join us again in the summer term in psychology in the second term, but in the first year of the Bachelor of Psychology, we discuss the GLM and all its special cases, including ANOVA and ANCOVA and other things. Um, yeah. So what is the GLM? The GLM refers to this um, equation here. Um, we have an observable random vector modeling data. So we keep with, uh, with the notation for using Y for observable random variables. And then um, in the GLM, we have, of course, a design matrix um, and times P matrix and a vector of beta parameters called beta parameter vector and um, an unobservable or not directly observable um, random vector modeling random error that is uh, multivariate normally distributed. Um, and <clears throat> I'm assuming here that it's uh, also is uh, um, doesn't have any uh, positive covariation between its uh, components. Um, so this is, of course, the model that's behind uh, everything that you know from frequentist statistics in terms of uh, normal uh, distributed errors. Can you turn off your mics at home? Thank you. Um, and the um, 
yeah so the the special cases for example that we looked at uh, yesterday was uh, if the design matrix is all ones and we have just a single parameter here which we then called mu then um of course each of these individual data points is um, distributed according to a univariate normal distribution um, centered on zero and this covariance matrix then implies that uh, all of the data points are independent and all have the same variance parameter so that's what's written down here later on we will or in the very end uh, of this thing here we will um, look at the um, simple linear regression form of this where we have um, a column of uh, ones and then a column of our um, independent variable or our um, predictor regressor however you want to call it so i really hope that you're all familiar with that um, i just um, bring up the notation here again um, and this is what we want to apply this to um, and yeah the motivation is here of course to do um, bayesian inference for the glm because as you know the glm um, is a unification of many models so the, most of the linear models in frequentist statistics uh, are special cases of the glm so if we have a means to do bayesian inference for the glm then we of course have a means to do uh, inference in simple linear regression multiple linear regression ANOVA and COVA um, and um, one thing i'm forgetting right now but um so then we have a general purpose uh, thing for a bayesian inference in much of where we usually always do um frequent statistics and there are um in addition like i already said in addition to the variational inference for that there are of course uh, um other ways to do Bayesian inference in GLMs, for example, with the gamma, uh, uh, Gaussian gamma model, there is this paper by Lindley, which I think I mentioned in the introduction briefly from 72, that is about base estimates for linear models. So um, you can do Bayesian inference in GLMs without variational inference, but then if one wants to study variational inference, it also doesn't hurt to look how it looks in the context of the GLM. Um, yeah, so um, I call it here Gaussian gamma regression model. Um, yeah, can just um, maybe I, I, yeah, so the Gaussian gamma regression model. So, regression is, of course, a specific case of the uh, GLM. We don't necessarily need to have regression in mind here. This works for all GLMs. I think I this is still from the uh, statistics for data science course where I didn't want to mentioned the GLM at all. So I called it regression model, but it's uh, of course the GLM. So um, now if we want to um, do Bayesian inference in the uh, GLM, um, in contrast to frequentist inference, we of course uh, not only generate um, point estimates for beta and sigma square, but we assume a prior uh, for beta and a prior for sigma square. Um, for better or worse, uh, one thing that is um, always happening when um, or often happening when using Bayesian inference for variance parameters is that um, one uses um, the inverse of the variance parameter, which is uh, called lambda. At this point, I can't give any good reasons why this is being done. Um, there definitely are reasons, um, but I can't think of them right now. Um, so, but it also doesn't change much. So, um, also it doesn't change anything. So, if we um, we basically reformulate the GLM that we have here as uh, multivariate normal over the random vector y with expectation parameter x beta and covariance matrix sigma square i n, uh, instead of parameterizing in terms of uh, uh, sigma square, we um, parameterize it in terms of um, lambda which is defined as one over sigma square so um, here we then have uh, lambda to the power of minus one because lambda to the power of minus one uh, is then sigma square so um, it's just yeah using a precision parameter so the variance parameter measures the variability high variance parameter more data variability the precision parameter measures the 
precision, so higher precision parameter, less variability. But that's just because the reciprocal of the uh, variance parameter, yeah, I, the, the derivation of this algorithm is in terms of this parameterization. If one really doesn't like it, one can, of course, also give a variance parameter um, 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 form of the whole thing, but yeah, it, it doesn't buy uh, much or anything. Um, so this is why here now a lambda is turning up. Uh, so lambda defined as one over sigma square. And um, now if we go from this setting where we have beta and sigma square, and we now want to um, give a distribution over beta and uh, sigma square or one over sigma square, so lambda, um, then of course we get into the context of a um, general linear, uh, sorry, of a probabilistic model. And for this, uh, we have uh, this form, so py beta lambda. You can, if you now link this to the Bayesian inference that we've seen so far, um, or yesterday, let's say, and the day before, you can summarize beta and lambda into theta. That's then your parameter. So that's um, the concatenation of beta and lambda is theta. And um, if you uh, do this in terms of um, variation inference, then Z would be beta lambda and um, these uh, Z and uh, uh, ZS and Z without S would be uh, these um, components of um, Z. So this is all just notation. The important point is, is that um, one thing here is observable, that's data, and we write down the likelihood conditioned on the unobservable random variables, and we define um, marginal probabilities for the unobservable uh, random variables, um, and um, yeah, they uh, are here and together they of course form the joint distribution. So we define a probabilistic model. Um, the likelihood um, here has the form of the GLM, so a multivariate normal um, center, um, yeah, centered or uh, with the expectation parameter given by the design matrix times the beta parameter vector and a covariance matrix parameter given by um, the precision parameter times the identity matrix. So again, assuming um, yeah, conditional independence of the data points given beta and lambda. Um, for the marginal, um, so for the prior distribution for beta, so for the beta parameters, so for example, in simple linear regression, your offset and slope parameters, or in um, the case of the one cell t test, your expectation parameter, um, we assume a, a normal distribution, so a multivariate normal distribution, depending on the dimensionality of beta, centered on zero, and um, with um, also um, spherical covariance matrix, parameterized also by a precision parameter that we call alpha. So I guess, uh, yeah. So don't get, yeah there's so forget about this alpha here that's not something different there are only that many Greek letters and we have to use them again so this alpha here um, is just the precision parameter of the uh, beta prior and for lambda uh, finally we use um, the gamma distribution with uh, in the um, uh, shape and scale parameterization, where we call um, the parameters beta lambda and gamma lambda. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's there's no there are too few uh, uh, letters and uh, too many uh, concepts that one wants to uh, write down as symbols. So um, this beta lambda, of course, has nothing to do with this beta here. Uh, this is just the parameter of um, the gamma distribution. Yeah, that's the model. So the um, the parameters in terms of a um, statistical model of this model are uh, beta and lambda. So beta and sigma square, if you want. Uh, and the hyperparameters, so the parameters of the marginal distributions are alpha, beta, lambda, and gamma, lambda, um, where one is the precision of the prior um, 
well, this expectation parameter here. So I, that's also a little bit annoying when I implemented this. This is, of course, also a, a parameter. So one could also here write mu beta and uh, sigma square beta and then set mu beta to 0p, so the, uh, the zero vector. Yeah. Um, this is what I said. The unobserved random vector takes the form beta lambda. Um, and yes, um, so the um, this is actually a non-conjugate Bayesian uh, regression model. So I'm still not sure, but I think it's um, you get to the conjugate form if you um, condition beta on lambda. So if uh, the I think the um, the variance of the marginal distribution of uh, beta. Um, if that is dependent on lambda, then you have this, uh, um, then you get to a conjugate form. So this Gaussian gamma model that I mentioned, or this uh, multivariate Gaussian Wishart model. Um, but I always found that a little bit weird to assume that. So I find it a little bit more natural to say, okay, our beta, our effects vector, and our uh, precision parameter have nothing to do with one another from the outset um, and but then it's actually there's no conjugate um, solution um, for this and then one actually needs uh, variational inference if so one doesn't need variational inference or something else but uh, one doesn't need an approximate variational or um, uh, numerical sampling scheme for um, Bayesian inference in the GLM but for this kind of Bayesian inference one does need it. Okay, so that's the model um, that we now want to uh, apply variational inference to. And what we actually apply there is taken from this, uh, let me, oops, is taken from this paper here. Um, there we go. It's taken from this uh, paper by Will Penny. Uh, in new image 2003 variation of Bayesian inference for fmi time series so you can see that basically that was called uh, <laughs> in both variation of Bayesian inference not variation of inference not variation of base um, and um, yeah um, it this is actually a little bit more general because um, it also is even more hierarchical than we uh, do here. There are uh, at one point, there's an additional hyperparameter somewhere. Um, but of course, then as a special case, it includes what we have here. And um, the um, here you can see um, what we discussed this morning. So uh, evidence marginal or log marginal likelihood. Uh, you see the mean field approximation popping up, uh, calculus of variations coming up, the distribution that maximum uh, can then be, there be shown to be here. Huh? This is what we showed without using the calculus of variations. Um, but this is um, essentially um, here our uh, freeform update. Um, and um, the uh, elbow in this scenario is called uh, free energy, which is, and I guess, negative free energy because they are still then dealing with or uh, struggling with the physics uh, part. And um, the derivation, um, so the um, proofs essentially uh, of why these uh, update formulas that I will show you come up in a session uh, in a, a second where they're coming from this is um, happening in the appendix so um, there you actually um, yeah need to somehow deal with these integrals that uh, happen and then um, you can sometimes find results for this in the literature and so on or um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there, it's a long proof. I never uh, worked through it. So maybe if I at one point want to do it, uh, I will do it. I uh, didn't do it uh, um, um, here. Um, 
because in the end, what happens is that one uses the equations that fall out of it um, and um, to find a proof then is nice, but um, in the end, uh, the same thing happens. But this is where you, if you are um, interested in um, the question of where these um, update com formulas come from, so how you get from, and to make this transparent, um, how you get from, And it was the wrong thing. How you get from well, the slide where you get from here. Um, saying, okay, you get the variational uh, um, distribution uh, like this, or maybe even more explicitly how you get from, from here to what I now show you. That's in the appendix of the paper that I just uh, showed you. The And this is where then variational inference is a little bit tedious because you have to do these um, um, calculations, these analytical derivations. Um, however, in the end, you have done the derivations and you end up with update formulas. And um, this is then uh, what I uh, want to show you here um, with, um, in terms of the uh, Kavi algorithm. So um, we use freeform mean field variation inference. Um, so we assume that um, the distribution Q by which we want to, um, or with which we want to approximate uh, the posterior of a beta lambda given Y, we assume that this factorizes into Q beta and Q lambda. And um, under this assumption, um, the update equations uh, that fall out uh, take this form. Um, of course, they also rely um, on uh, some initial values. So um, what this is, uh, I'll speak about in a second, but uh, you, one has to start somewhere. And um, actually, one wouldn't, does one have to initialize this? Not necessarily, I think. Uh, no. So in principle, we wouldn't have to initialize this, but we have to um, we have to have some uh, values for a beta um, for b lambda and c lambda in the beginning. So what are these things? So um, there, one has to always pay a little bit attention to um, which parameters one is dealing with. So we have introduced. Um, the parameters of the marginal um, so of the prior distributions here with uh, Greek letters. So this is uh, uh, alpha and beta lambda and gamma lambda. And for the variational distributions, we um, now um, um, find from the um, from the derivation of this freeform algorithm that actually the variational distribution is a multivariate normal distribution and we parameterize this uh, using m beta and s beta so my convention there is the variational parameters always have roman uh, letters and um, the um, prior and marginal distribution have Greek letters. So that's my uh, way to keep the parameters of the probabilistic model separate from the parameters of the variational distributions because the parameters of the variational distributions you change during the um, algorithm so they get updated but the parameters of the probabilistic model uh, they don't change, they are defined. If you change them then uh, you are in an empirical based setting, but they are not uh, being changed. Uh, so this is pure Bayesian inference. You 
put up, uh, you do, you define your uh, probabilistic model, so you define your prior, and then you try to figure out the posterior density. You don't fiddle around with the prior parameters. So that's why I use different, slightly different notation for them. So as I already mentioned, the, it turns out that the um, distribution of the beta parameter is a, a normal uh, distribution, the variational distribution, and um, is parameterized in terms of its expectation parameter m beta and its covariance matrix parameter s beta. And um, the, it also turns out that the variational distribution for lambda is again a gamma distribution, but with um, uh, or with, with um, shape and scale parameter beta lambda and c lambda. And they um, the thing then is that of course if you um, the only thing that you need to update are the parameters so you don't need to really update a distribution because the distribution of course uh, is um, if you know the type and you know the parameter then you have the distribution so in the algorithm what happens is actually very similar to what we've seen in uh, conjugate inference um, you don't somehow calculate with distributions or probability density function, probability mass functions, but you calculate with parameter values. And um, so they need to be initialized somehow, and I initialize them here to the uh, values uh, of the prior distributions, but they could uh, or not quite actually. Um, this is um, um, initialized um, because it will always, uh, the update formula always says set it to this, and this is just, uh, is a fixed uh, number. So n is always fixed as the number of data points and gamma is the prior um, uh, parameter. So um, it makes sense to keep it from the beginning at that. Um, so essentially one needs to, uh, also the, the most crucial thing is here to set up um, this. And then um, these again, so to make this uh, as transparent as possible, this thing here um, and uh, specifically this thing and this thing, so one and two, um, they take um, the f these forms um, so that's uh, the first update, that's the other update. The update for beta um, means updating the uh, covariance matrix parameter of the variational distribution over beta and the expectation parameter. And here's the formula. Um, so uh, for the um, covariance matrix parameter, the um, design matrix plays a role. The, um, parameters of the variational uh, distribution of the precision parameter plays a role. Um, and for uh, the expectation parameter, um, the covariance matrix parameter plays a role and the data. So the data enter uh, here. Uh, that's uh, one uh, point where the data enter. If one compares these update equations with um, um, things that one is maybe more familiar with, uh, for example, uh, the better head estimator and the GLM, one sees that these things are generalizations of what is going on there. And that's then a way to understand these uh, update equations because yeah, they are equations, but the question is, so one question is always, where do they come from? But even if you know where they come from, it doesn't really mean that you understand what's, uh, what they are doing. But uh, so maybe I just highlight here that this is not completely unlike uh, a better parameter estimation. So if you uh, s uh, consider here zero precision, uh, um, so yeah, zero precision, and you ignore the uncertainty uh, of lambda, then uh, so, um, or yeah, not ignore the uncertainty, but you have one here, so it shouldn't be zero, but you, um, yeah, for some reason you should get here to one. Um, then you would have here xtx, so design matrix to the power of minus one. And um, this is uh, entering here. Again, if you assume this is one, then you have here xtx to the power of minus one xty. And if you're familiar with uh, frequentist inference, uh, then in the GLM, then this is exactly the form of the beta parameter estimator. So essentially in the setting variational inference does a little bit more. Um, there are additional terms that uh, come in that 
uh, intuitively you can think about it, they uh, represent the uncertainty that is neglected in uh, frequentist uh, settings. Um, so yeah, that's one way to think about it. So that's the uh, update for the beta parameter and the update for the uh, lambda parameter is shown here. And also here, you one sees some familiar things. So of course, uh, lambda um, refers to, uh, to the inverse of the variance parameter. And um, here, at least one sees something fairly familiar because this is um, the um, sum of squares. So this is the data minus the prediction of the model. Um, so with this, uh, with the current estimate, so this is the um, essentially the residual sum of squares, and then the whole thing is inverted because we are uh, dealing with the uh, inverse of the um, variance. There are then other terms that then really get hard to interpret. Uh, so um, we have, if so we worked a lot on variation and pace for the GLM in this 2017 paper, and in the supplement. Uh, yeah, there's a discussion of all the terms that show up in these uh, update equations, but also in the variation of free energy or in the elbow, of course, um, with it, with trying to understand what they mean. But it's it really gets hard to understand what the trace of this matrix means. I mean, the, the trace is the product of the diagonal entries. Yeah. Of course, it measures the variance somehow, and uh, what is ignored are the covariances and so on. But it's, it's yeah. at one point, it becomes not that easy to grasp intuitively what this is actually doing. And then we're always at the new, uh, almost at new network uh, level. So that's, um, these are two things that one has to work out in this freeform variational inference, um, namely the update equations but also the elbow itself um, that one wants to monitor to, and uh, of course also to have as a um, approximation of the log model evidence. Um, this is also of course defined in terms of a uh, um, integral. Um, so where are we there? So for a given uh, then forms of Q um, and for a given form of P, one also has to work out um, what now the um, yeah, elbow is. And this is then always an additional analytical step that one needs to take. And um, it then often, or yeah, it usually turns out um, that um, there is uh, something that is uh, something like a, a, a likelihood function. So if you have seen um, maximum likelihood estimation for the GLM. Um, yeah, you um, um, this um, deviation between the data and the prediction of the uh, model um, as a function of a parameter also um, features in the um, GLM, but there are more terms entering, which refer to the fact that you take essentially an expectation of um, the likelihood. So this is, and H sees that actually there is an expectation of the likelihood in the general formula. Um, so um, this is uh, um, here, or maybe it's even clearer if we look at this. Uh, no, that's not clearer. But here we have, of course, um, PY, uh, PYZ which of course um, we can also factor into PY given Z. And that's then um, with the only difference that that Z is a random variable is of course um, the likelihood. So the probability of the data is a function of the parameters that's uh, in here. Um, and then there's of course also the contribution of the prior. Um, and then there's an expectation formed about it with respect to QZ. So this is why this is sometimes referred as to as average likelihood uh, or expected likelihood. Um, and then of course, there's more things than in the um, likelihood function, namely things that um, relate to um, the prior. Um, so 
there are then also in the BKL divergences um, uh, of the variational distribution with respect to the prior distribution um, in, in these two terms. And if one then tries to understand what's going on there, um, this is not too unhelpful because um, one can understand this in the sense that um, okay one tries to um, minimize the deviation uh, of um, the day of the the prediction of the model as a function of the estimates uh, from the data so one wants to minimize the prediction error uh, so find estimates that minimize the prediction error but um, one also doesn't want to make the uh, this whole this approximation too complex in the sense that one goes away very much from um, the original model. So this the scale divergence. So that there's this trade-off between. So that's then what people like to talk about: this trade-off between accuracy and complexity. And um, one punishes um, large deviations uh, from the prior, so not to do something fairly arbitrary. But that said, this is also not the so you people like to talk about these things and say, yeah, and this is then this is just complexity minus accuracy and so on. But then, it, or sorry, accuracy minus complexity. Carl Fristen says that, and this is just accuracy minus complexity. Yeah, the question is, what is complexity really? And um, there, it then sometimes, so it, often these are very, um, there's a precise meaning then if you look at the formulas that uh, follow out how complexity is, is measured, for example. So, and this is, for example, this is a very different complexity measure than you might know from BIC or I, I, AIC or something um, where um, you just count the number of um, um, variables or of parameters. Anyway, so one can think a lot about these uh, equations that fall out of variational inference, even for such a simple model uh, like the GLM. And of course, in in the tech world, they don't apply to the GLM, but, but to um, yeah, horribly complicated models that no one understands anymore, but maybe they generate nice, nice pictures. So that's these are the results. As I said, I didn't uh, now work you through uh, how they are derived, but I'm telling you, uh, um, well, I wrote down here what they are and give you a little bit of a hint of what this can be related to. But in the end, one has to also think about what this means oneself. Yeah. Um, so I then um, implemented this, um, just mainly to show what it really comes down to. Um, and I implemented it for um the scenario that we saw yesterday so independent uh, and identically distributed univariate gaussian data points so the one sample t test scenario so the design matrix is just a column of ones and i sample some data and here are then the sample data for a true but unknown parameter of two a better parameter of two so the values uh, somehow um, yeah, vary uh, around two and um, a variance uh, parameter or lambda parameter of one. Uh, of course, if lambda is one, then also variance uh, is one. So, um, yeah, so that's um, the model here. So, this is uh, yeah, sampling from a univariate Gaussian with population parameters two and one. Um, as a prior, um, yeah, one basically has to fix the mu beta and the alpha parameter. So um, that was set to zero, and um, yeah, the alpha to one over ten, and um, this comes down to this. Um, prior distribution, this is the true but unknown parameter. Um, for the gamma, um, yeah, I, uh, I chose uh, one, one. Actually, um, I didn't really, so we will see in a second. I'm not, I can't really say that I'm happy with my R implementation. There's something not working. So this is why I have another uh, application from our research uh, after that. 
but um, at least it works for uh, uh, the better um, uh, updates. So these are the prior distributions. And then the algorithm itself and what it really comes down to is this bit here. So um, the here I initialize the um, parameters or the hyperparameters hyper well, the uh, variation of parameters to so M beta, S beta for Q beta and uh, B lambda, C lambda for Q lambda. And um, then if they are initialized, it's just uh, um, a question of updating. So there's uh, first the update for beta, which uh, implements this formula here and then this formula. So these are these, this line and this line solve is the matrix inverse. And um, then it implements uh, this line and this line, although this could also be, uh, this doesn't really need to be updated again and again because it always is at the same number. Um, and um, that's then it. What I actually tried to work in there this morning was uh, also the um, elbow, but then uh, that didn't quite work this morning if I wanted to do it quickly. So, and I have already implemented this in MATLAB some years back, so I wasn't really that motivated to um, do this again because I have a very nice implementation, uh, MATLAB implementation of that, and I will show you bits and pieces of that. So what do we get uh, from this? Um, the this is the um, um, the converged result for the variational distribution for beta, um, and um, this is converging after four iterations or so. It's not that this is running for hours or something like this. This uh, is doing four iterations, and then um, it's um, basically staying at the um, uh, below uh, the convergence criterion. To actually use this, I don't think I use it. I just looked at the uh, um, parameter estimates and saw that they didn't uh, change anymore. And um, the um, true but unknown value for the um, better parameter is then um, very well recovered. So that was two and the posterior is centered at two. For the gamma, it does not really work. So I, I have a hard time to tell whether this is, whether I've uh, implemented something wrong or whether that's a feature. I'm not sure, but I didn't also didn't have the time to uh, work out uh, what's uh, going on on there and I previously validated uh, this um, in a specific scenario that I can tell you about in a second. Uh, and so I believe that uh, definitely what will Penny and others derive there that works in principle, although I have to say, I don't really have the complete qualitative, uh, don't qualitative study, but I can show you uh, in a second, an example where the full power of this is a little bit uh, clearer. Yeah, so that's, um, um, before I show you a last application of this, this is the freeform variational inference for the Gaussian gamma model. Um, it comes down to parameter update equations, just as we saw it for the better binomial and for the Gaussian Gaussian model yesterday. The equations get a little bit bigger, as you can see, and you can tell from this uh, slide, but they also still, um, um, don't get out of hand so that there are millions of terms or something like that. It's in the end, it's this. Questions right now, before I show you a little bit more of an interesting application, maybe. Okay, so then the very last bit for the workshop. Um, so, Yesterday, I think I briefly mentioned that I don't use <laughs> any of this in uh, my own research. But then also this morning, I realized that's not completely true. Um, we actually used um, exactly this fixed form variational inference uh, uh, framework in a recent uh, paper on EEG modeling. And actually, if you know what SPM is and uh, you ever wondered what happens if you click at, uh, when you click estimate GLM, not classical, 
which is the default, but you click base, um, then this is actually what happens. So the uh, free from variational inference algorithm that uh, um, will derive there that's implemented in SPM under this Bayesian estimation uh, button. Um, but of course, even without SPM, one can use this uh, algorithm for great good. And this is an example from uh, a recent study we did as a um, as a follow up paper to the paper that came out almost ten years earlier. But well, um, it's also not the greatest paper. This Giesian paper, it's a little, it's quite chaotic. This paper, I'm not the I biggest fan of this paper, but uh, so be it. Um, what this was about was EEG data and single trials. Um, so I don't know how familiar you guys are with EEG data and single trial modeling, but Markus Ulsberger, he invented single trial modeling. So uh, if you are in the SFB, you might have seen a talk by Markus um, and he did some single trial EEG modeling back in the days and uh, things still does and so do we um, and um, the idea is there to look at eg features um, so for example the amplitude of some uh, voltage deflection like the p300 or something like that and then have um, a computational model that generates a prediction for this amplitude on a trial to trial basis um, and then basically tracking how neural signals evolve over the term of an experiment and uh, this is uh, shown here so we have 300 trials here <clears throat> sorry 300 trials here and um, we have, um, in this case, we wanted to compare four different models. Um, and these four different models are null model. The gray line here is uh, the prediction of this null model. Obviously, it predicts one all the time. So this is a, a simulation, um, but the, it doesn't predict any variation. The data that is sampled from this is, so this is a GLM, so this is Y uh, equals X beta plus epsilon. And what you see here in blue as sampled data from it, that is just the uh, random noise um, that you get from, from this term here, the epsilon term. Now, this is of course not the only model that we want to use to, to predict the single trial EEG features, um, but we um, also used different surprise models. And these surprise models derive from Bayesian learners that learn the same sequence as the participant is exposed to, and then um, um, learn them and uh, tell us essentially how surprised they are of always the next stimulus. So in this case, the stimulus here is a um, was a somatosensory stimulus. This is all simulated data, so it doesn't really matter what the stimulus was. But in the study, uh, it was um, um, an ele electrical shock. Can do the same thing with auditor auditory uh, stimuli. So it's it's all about sequence learning. Um, you can do it with words. We have a collaboration where we recently got the reviews with Milena Rabowski, where we're doing the same thing with words. Um, yeah, it's sequence learning in EEG. Um, and uh, these Bayesian learners that see the same sequence as the participants can be surprised, but how surprised they are depends on what, how we quantify their surprise and their different forms of surprise. Uh, Wolfram Gerstner and uh, Alizera and so on, they now have a very nice paper in uh, mathematical psychology on different forms of surprise. And we have uh, looked here at predictive surprise. Roughly, that's the surprise that Carl Fristen always talks about, Bayesian surprise. That's the surprise that uh, we found correlates with uh, uh, somato sensation EG, because it's the only thing that we looked at in 2012. Now we're looking at more, but we actually replicate the 2012 results about that then confidence uh, corrected surprise which is another form of surprise which is also useful and actually a kind of a combination of the two 
uh, the point here is we have four different models and the four different models are um, represented by the fact that these gray lines that you see here, although I guess it's a little bit hard to see, are a little bit different. Um, and of course, they're all very different from the null model. And what we then want to do there and what we of course always want to do in Bayesian inference is first of all, get the um, posterior so the um, posterior or approximate the posterior and approximate the um, um, log uh, model evidence. And in um, both of them are of course interesting. Um, the log model evidence is mainly interesting for uh, model comparison. And um, this is also what the main use of uh, the variational inference algorithm actually in the study then is about. So um, this is a simulation where we generated data from the null model, the predictive surprise model, the Bayesian surprise model, and the confidence correct corrected surprise model. And then we analyze um, data of that form with each of the models. So uh, null model, predictive surprise, Bayesian surprise, and confidence corrected surprise. Belinda, this is model validation, like in uh, Lilla's paper. Um, and of course, something that you are also about to do. Um, and um, so we generate from one model and then we compare our model evidence criterion and um, yeah, hope for the best. Um, so this F here, that's the elbow. It's just called F because Felix was around and he lives in the free energy world. I guess, uh, I don't know why I didn't call it elbow here. Um, and then the question is which model, given that we know uh, how the data was generated has the highest model evidence. And of course, to make sure that some analysis pipeline is working, one wants to see that if, for example, the data is generated by this model PS, that then also the model evidence for PS is largest. And this works. So um, for if it's generated by Bayesian surprise, uh, it's the highest model evidence is given for Bayesian surprise. If it's uh, generated by um, confidence correct surprise, the highest is given by confidence confidence corrected surprise and if it's generated by the null model, the highest is given by um, the null model. Um, this is always um, normalized with respect to the null model, um, but the other ones are lower. Not much, but they are. And um, so this is um, then uh, using the um, elbow after conver uh, convergence. And if one looks a little bit more into the details there, one of course has um, the true but unknown values in a simulation. So this is what's here shown in red. Um, and one has the prior parameters, which is shown in gray. And uh, one has the converged uh, variational parameters, um, which is shown in blue here. And then what one wants to see essentially is that, uh, um, yeah, the, um, that the true but unknown parameters can be recovered depending of course like yesterday on the width of the um, prior distribution but here we uh, also tried to like we discussed yesterday um, try to use fairly uninformative uh, priors with the major aim of uh, getting a good getting a model evidence criterion um, and um, yeah and, and basically uh, having relative relaxed priors and so this was the validation of this algorithm, which is then used in the paper, which I'm now not discussing, to find some exciting results of uh, how the brain works and uh, that it uses Bayesian inference. Good. So that was that. Now, of course, much more could be said about variation inference, much more could be said about um, um, Bayesian inference, but in the end, it's all about doing this and starting from a probabilistic model and then computing marginal and conditional distributions in a probabilistic model that one has defined that did not come from somewhere, but somebody sat down and said, okay, I want to use this probabilistic model. 
and then they sit there and ask themselves, okay, if I now observe something, what is actually my conditional distribution and what is my marginal uh, probability for observing this data? That's the whole problem. Good, so that was that um, as an intro to Bayesian inference. Of course, much more could be said. I um, um, yesterday bought a new book, maybe that I can uh, recommend um, if you want to learn more Bayesian inference in um, um, uh, in a modern setting. I'm just looking up the um, the book because I just uh, saw it yesterday, um, and it it seems to be very good. Um, uh, no, I don't find it that quickly. Uh, wait a second, I want to show you this book because it's uh, it's good, I think. I had a look at it. Um, it just came out quite recently. And there, and it's coming today between 12.30 and 3.30. It's being delivered then. Uh, I mean this book here. Um, so it's called. At least I just see the slide. Ah, yeah, sorry. But you see me, right? Do you see me? Ah, I had turned it off. So, yeah, okay. Uh, so this book here, um, that's. Actually, a novel book, Computational Bayesian Statistics, that's what it's called. Uh, it's a book came out, I think, last year or something. It, it really looks nice. Um, so if you want to learn more, that's definitely something where you can look and um, yeah, learn more. Good. Um, so are there um, questions to the last bit here or uh, general questions about the whole course? something that you want to discuss Always. yeah so one thing i was still wondering about was when one would use the fixed form variational inference then uh, yeah so it's it's not really so they it's not like there cannot be clear-cut recommendations. In this case, you do this, you uh, do that. Um, so these um, these are methods that have been developed uh, and are still being developed over the last 20 years. And um, the often they have been developed, but they haven't been applied that much. Um, so it's not that... Um, there's a long history of applying these methods and then there's a lot of experience with in this case they work and in this case they don't work. This is basically a contemporary data analysis development. So um, I know when they are being used. So, so fixed form variational inference uh, is being used, for example, in dynamic cause modeling um, of fMRI or EEG data. Um, it is a reasonable starting point if one is uh, happy with um, giving a fixed form to the approximate posterior. So if you are not worried about that your approximation is bad because you have the wrong function class, then if you're happy with approximating things using, for example, Gaussians or other distributions, yeah, one can set out and do it. The nice thing is um, it's maybe a little bit less analytically demanding than uh, free from variational inference. And there's also no guarantee in terms of free from variational inference. Well, yeah, in principle, there is a guarantee because it uh, says, okay, you need to set it to these distributions, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I can't really give a recommendation. I just, uh, I feel the fixed form variational inference is um, a little bit more straightforward than the free form variational inference because in the end it uh, ends up with um, 
a function that you need to optimize. And uh, for this, for optimizing a function, uh, one can then uh, use the algorithms that have been validated um, a long time in numerical optimization. So one can use standard numerical optimization routines for optimizing a new target function. And this is then very similar to doing numerical maximum likelihood estimation just with a different target function. Um, it's the same thing as, uh, I don't know, uh, support vector machine uh, learning. Um, you have a function, you have a target function, an objective function, however you want to call it, and you um, find and you optimize it. And this is then uh, in, in fixed form variation inference, this is then very familiar and feels, um, yeah, somehow very straightforward. Bonds, one has derived the elbow. Um, this always uh, involves uh, where are we? this involves uh, an analysis or calculus um, essentially on each iteration and um, yeah and then you end up with update formulas that you need to check whether they actually um, although they should, but if you did some, if there's an error in your derivation, then as you saw here, <laughs> that's not in the derivation, that's I guess more in the implementation, it doesn't really look that awesome with my uh, gamma here. And it's a little bit harder to tell what's going on. And if you just have a um, function that you want to optimize, then if you're fairly confident in your function, then fixed form makes sense. But then you can also, uh, then you can always, always say, but maybe the uh, posterior looks very different. So no recommendation given. Mm -hmm. So it's really when you can be somewhat confident that you, you have a Gaussian posterior, then it definitely makes more sense. Oh, it's easier, simpler, at least to take the uh, fixed form. Yeah. But otherwise, so, probably free form. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, of course, if you're in a full Gaussian model, then you don't need this at all. So, if everything is Gaussian, so you don't have a gamma in there somewhere, then of course, um, you can just use the results of the multivariate Gaussian. Um, but of course, Gaussians are. Uh, yeah, sensible always if you assume that you uh, you have something unimodal. Um, so if if you assume you have something bimodal, so with multiple peaks, uh, but you don't know. That's the thing. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> it's just uh, there. It's uh, the, the, so the first thing uh, would be to not uh, create a, a probabilistic model that is so complex that you can't work out the posterior. That would be the first recommendation. So use a probabilistic model where you actually can work out the posterior distribution. If for some reason you want to have a model that is so complex that you can't work out the posterior distribution, yeah, uh, start to experiment. Um, for me, the important thing is always, but this is regardless of um, whether you um, use Bayesian inference or um, frequentist inference or point estimation, maximum likelihood inference, maybe with uh, big and so on. The important thing is if you set up a new model, um, which is of course something you want to do in science because you want to uh, uh, develop theories and models are theories. If you set up a new model um, and you use this model to actually apply it to data, then it makes uh, sense to um, check whether your analysis pipeline um, can recover your parameters um, and uh, your um, models to reasonable certainty. So the, the thing is, if you, of course, this only model recovery only works up to a certain level of noise. If you don't have any signal in your data anymore, that you also that you simulate, then of course, model recovery doesn't work anymore. But um, in relatively, yeah, in, in, in nice or um, in not malignant uh, 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 signal to noise ratio scenarios, um, whatever you use for um, 
parameter inference for model estimation and for model evaluation, um, make sure that if you know what the data is about, so if you simulate data from a known model, make sure that uh, your uh, data analysis routine recovers that. This can be done analytically, and if you have very simple models, then this is very well known, and then you don't have to do it. So you don't have to uh, recover. If you do an F test, you don't have to start with model recovery. But if you're uh, doing something novel, um, with a new model that is not a GLM, for example, or a GLM with some specific prior distributions, then, um, yeah, do model recovery study and do parameter recovery study to make sure that if you know what's going on, that you then, uh, your data analysis uh, tells you, okay, I recover what we knew was going on. So that's, that's, uh, that's really a recommendation what the exact uh, data analysis pipeline is that you use to this uh, and well, i don't know I, I mean bayesian inference makes more sense than frequentist inference that's for sure but if you're a phd student and uh, you first need to learn about your model and then you need to learn about maximum likelihood then maybe you don't want to learn about uh, variational inference or um, MCMC because at one point you also want to finish a PhD. Yeah, so that's my that's the general recommendation. Okay, thanks. Good. Other questions? Okay, then uh, thank you for attending. Watch the videos, play with the code, um, and um, yeah, have fun and learn something most of all. There's a lot of stuff to learn. Okay, then goodbye and see maybe this cohort again in March or other people, or maybe see you uh, next week in our um, basic psychology statistics courses. Bye-bye.